All right, now in Exodus chapter 3, the part of this chapter I want to focus in on starts in verse number 13. This is after you know, Moses sees the burning bush and he goes to see what this is all about. And, um, and God speaks to him out of the bush and he tells him, hey, you know, I'm going to send you out to, to free you know, the, your, your brethren, the children of Israel, out of the bondage and, and out of the suffering that they've been dealing with in the, in the land of Egypt. And um, Moses asked God, he said, okay, well, wait, you're sending me to do all this stuff. They're going to ask me, you know, who sent me? Like, like, what's the name of God? You know, what is your name, God? And this is where he tells them, look at verse number 13. It says, and Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So when he asked him, you know, Who shall I say send me? He said, I am. It's just, it's a real simple statement, but it's real profound. God is. God is, he's everlasting. Just the everlasting God hath sent you. He says, I am hath sent you. Now, what I'm going to be exposing this morning is, um, I've been running into quite a few Jehovah's Witnesses out soul winning. And, you know, one of their big things, and they always want to get stuck on is, well, what's the name of God? You know, you're trying to talk to them about eternal life. You're trying to talk to them about salvation. And they're like, well, do you even know what God's name is? Yep. And now I'm preaching this sermon, but it doesn't change the way that you should act at the door. Okay, I'm going to give you a lot of evidence here, and we're going to go over a lot of scripture about God's name, and there is importance to God's name, but um, it's not something that we need to just be hung up on with every person we talk to, especially if they're not saved. We don't need to just be continually talking about Jehovah and God's names and all these other things. But when, when you do go so and you run into a Jehovah's Witness, and even though I know these answers, I have this scripture, I could go and prove this to them, I usually don't. Because they need to get saved. Right. Mm -hmm. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is just a rabbit trail. This is something that they're going to try to get you off on. And just take this little piece of advice in general. When you go out and try to, to preach the gospel of Jesus to people, they're always going to be coming at you with different questions. I mean, it could be crazy. You know, what about aliens? What about this? What about that? And <laughs> the problem is you can't answer every question or else you'll never get through preaching them the gospel of Christ. So you need to be able to just say, you know, we'll get back to this later, but I want to talk about this right now. And so, you know, take, keep that in mind as you, as you listen to this sermon. Now, it could still come in useful because you do run into people. Maybe you have friends. Maybe you have relatives where you get into longer conversations. People you deal with, maybe at work, that might be a Jehovah's Witness and you know, you've already tried to give them the gospel, but there's things that you could still continue to talk about. Some people are going to need to hear God's word over and over again. And sometimes it's going to make sense to be able to take the time and go over a few of these things that are really important to them. Obviously, they need to hear the gospel, but, um, you know, I spent about, what was it, about an hour, an hour and a half with that, with that guy about a month ago. And, um, but he was listening. He was engaging. It was a good conversation. He was hearing what I had to say, and I was showing him a lot of proofs. But I was more focused. I, was, I never got into God's name. I was focused on Jesus Christ being a deity, being God in the flesh. I focused on those, those aspects. I focused on hell being a real place. I focused on the things that, that are all relevant to your salvation. But we are going to go over this this morning. We're, we're going to, you know, all of that being said, it's still important to understand this doctrine and to know. And, um, you know, if you are talking to people and they just come at you with God's name, at least you can have something here that you can quickly answer them with and then move on. But um, what I think is real interesting is in verse 15, you know, for, right after he got done saying, tell him, I am hath sent you. And he says, this is my name forever. So this is my name just till the end of time. So why is it that when they want to get stuck on you with the name of God, why don't they just say, I am? I mean, that says his name forever. He says, oh, it's Jehovah, it's Jehovah, and all this other stuff. Well, look, <coughs> I believe that Jehovah is, a is um, the meaning, 
I am that I am is encompassed in the, in the name Jehovah. Um, but it's funny that they don't use those words because they, um, in their, tra I forgot what their translation, I looked it up in the New World Translation, what the, he says here, because I was curious if they just replaced it with Jehovah because they replaced everything with Jehovah. But um, they had, it's not I am. I mean, I am is like powerful and, that's, and it says a lot. Even just in those two words, I am. There says something like, I will be. Or something. It's it's like the, everything that they have in their in their translation is wrong because they they don't understand verb tenses, and they have a works based salvation. So um, there's one day I had a Jehovah's Witness come to the door and, and he said and it was a, a boy and he's like, you know, a boy and his dad and and he, and he wanted to share with me a verse and it says you know, um, the one that says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. You know, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and shall be op uh, shall be opened unto you. And it's, their version says, keep on asking and it shall be given to you. Keep on knocking and it shall be, you know, it's like, no, <laughs> like, you don't have to just continually be doing this up all the time. You, you knock once and the door is going to be open unto you. You don't have to just keep on be like, hello, hello, is anyone home? God, you know, can you please open up the doors? Keep on knocking. Keep on knocking. No, but it's all part of their workspace salvation. Exactly. It's, it's this idea that you have to keep doing stuff. You have to continually work and strive to get saved. But flip over, if you would, just to Exodus chapter 6. A few chapters over. Exodus chapter 6. <clears throat> We're going to see here where God reveals his name, Jehovah. Um, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Now, he very clearly says right here, because they'll try to tell you, oh, you know, God's just a title, or God Almighty, that's just a title. Well, the Bible says that his name was God Almighty. That's how he was known to, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They didn't even know this name of Jehovah. Yet, the Jehovah's Witnesses want to spend so much time and effort and emphasis on, well, this is God's name. How could you even claim you know God? You don't even know his name. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob apparently didn't know his name either because he wasn't known as Jehovah unto them. They called him the Lord Almighty. And what they fail, you know, basically their, their whole thing falls apart with just God has many names. Yes. And they try to claim that God only has one name, and that is inherently false. And we're going to see that as we go through the scriptures as well. And we're going to see God's other names because they do have meaning and they are important. And that's one of the reasons why we're spending the time going through this because a name is an identity. For example, I am that I am. Part of God's identity is that he is eternal. He did not have a beginning. He does not have an ending. God is forever. There is nothing in existence that has that quality or that attribute of I am. All time, I mean, time, space, matter was all creation by God. God is the only being, entity, whatever you want to call God uh, of being just eternal from everlasting and to everlasting. And that is an important aspect that we can understand and that's why that's part of his name. And, um, and that's why he says, this is my name forever. Because he is everlasting. It's, it is, he is eternal. That's his name forever. But um, flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 4. Because we saw in Exodus 6, hey, his name was God Almighty to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was his name. That's how they knew him. That's, that's how they called him. Genesis 4, verse number 26. Genesis 4, 26 says, And to Seth... To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now Seth, he was a son of Adam and Eve, right? So then he had a son called Enos. So Adam and Eve's grandchild is born way a long time ago, right? Way early on in the earth's history. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Again, the name of the Lord. What are they calling on? They're not calling on Jehovah because they didn't know him as Jehovah. That's right. They're calling on the name, but it has to be a name. That's right. They have to be calling on something. It's the name of God. And 
again, just to, to de-emphasize just, oh, it has to be Jehovah, it has to be Jehovah. No, look, I'm not saying the name Jehovah is not important. I'm not saying that. It is, but it's not so important that that is the only thing, that that is the, um, you know, the only name that God has and you have to just be following this name because here we see that men called upon the name of the Lord, but they did not call upon Jehovah. Same representation, but, but different name. In, um, in Acts 2.21, you don't have to turn there, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? A great scripture referencing the, um, the Old Testament. And, um, of course, the, the New World Translation says, And everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Which is not quite the same thing. It's, you know, calling on the name of the Lord is not exactly the same thing as calling on the name of Jehovah. And, um, I was going to show, turn if you would back over to Exodus chapter number 2. Because we're going to see this real quick. It's, it's common for people in the Bible to have multiple names. Right? This is a common occurrence. <laughs> Nothing new here. We're going to see, even with Moses' father-in-law. And I just picked this up recently. I, didn't, I never really noticed this before. But um, look at Exodus chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 16. And it's, it's evident that this is Moses' father-in-law. It's pretty easy. There's a lot of proof from the scripture. But verse number 16 says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Again, Moses' father-in-law is this priest of Midian. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father... He said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. So Moses marries Zipporah. This man is the priest of Midian, and it says his name is Rule. Look at Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert. So it says here that his name is Jethro. So we have two different names right away in, in Exodus, showing that this is the same person, same man. He's got two different names. His name's Rule, his name's Jethro. People call him by both. Um, you remember Simon, Simon Peter, right? Jesus surnamed Simon. He gave him a new name of Peter or Cephas, right? He's known by these different names. The apostle Saul, Paul was named Saul and his name was changed to Paul. He was known by both names. Even Jesus Christ, he was, you know, a child shall be born, his name shall be called Emmanuel, yeah. right? His name is Emmanuel, his name is Jesus. But he's, but he's the same person, he's known by multiple names. And um, this is not uncommon at all. There's plenty of other examples that um, I'm not going to go through this morning, but um, there's plenty of names. So let's look at some of the other names of God. Turn, if you would, you're in Exodus, flip over to chapter 34. Exodus 34. As I mentioned earlier, names are important because we could learn very important things about a name. A name is never given in the Bible for no reason at all. You remember when the name Eve was given unto Eve because she is the mother of all living. That name has meaning. It means she is a mother. She's the mother of everything that's living. That's why the name was given to her. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Because they would make thee a father of many nations. There, there's so many meaning behind the names that it's not, you know, that's why I'm saying it's not just unimportant, like, oh, God's name doesn't matter. No, God's name does matter, but it's not just bound to one name. It's not just, oh, it, it's only Jehovah and that's it, and you can't call God by any other name because that's his real name. You could use titles, but this is his name. No. Look at Exodus 34, verse 14. Exodus 34, 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, does that not clearly say that God's name is Jealous? Yeah, the Lord, Jehovah's name is Jealous. Yep. That's his name. Now, and this is something that's very important to understand. 
Because especially with the way that our language is being used today and, you know, definitions of words tend to change a little bit over time and they, they, they gather connotations or it's associated, like this word specifically is associated negatively these days. If, if a man or a woman is, is said to be jealous, people will say, especially in a relationship, they'll say like, oh, that's a real negative thing. Oh, that's a real bad thing. Well, if that's such a bad thing, why is God's name jealous? Is that a negative attribute of, of God that he's jealous? Is that such a horrible thing that God is jealous? Now, again, people tend to associate this word with other meanings. They'll take jealous to mean all kinds of different things that like, that maybe you don't trust someone or that, that you have control issues or what, you know, all these different problems that a person might have saying he's jealous. Jealous means that you don't want like, I'm a jealous husband because I don't want my wife to be hanging around with other guys because I'm her husband. She does not need, she doesn't need another male friend in this world because I am her male friend. She doesn't need to be going out with anybody else because she's mine. And being jealous, this is exactly the way that God is using this word because he is God. He doesn't want you serving other gods. He doesn't want you worshiping and bowing down or singing praises unto fake gods and unto other gods. You can say, oh yeah, but they're not even real. What's the big deal? God's a jealous God. God wants your attention focused on Him. He wants your worship and your praise only going to Him. And it says He's a jealous God. And that is righteous and that is holy and that is a great attribute of God. So if a husband or a wife is to be jealous, hey, if a wife doesn't want her husband going around and having lunch and hanging out with all these other girls because her, his attention ought to be focused on her as his wife, that's a godly thing. That's a righteous attribute to have. And, and we live in a society because it's so permissive and you can say, oh, what do you, you don't trust me? You think I'm just going to go? No, look, there's no reason for that. And it's not even just a matter of, do you trust me? It's not even wise. It's not wise to go making all these friends with people of the opposite gender when you're already married and you should be thinking about your wife and saying, you know what? There is no reason to, to have this type of a relationship with someone other than my spouse because it could potentially lead to something more. And a lot of times these adulteries that, that happen are not intentional from the beginning. It's not something that they go out thinking, I want to find another woman. Oftentimes, it happens over time. They get to know somebody more and more, and then you start having problems, maybe, and things are fine at first. Your marriage is going great, and it's okay that you're spending time with this other person that's your friend, but then you start having problems, and you start talking to your other friend and confiding in them, and before you know it, you're starting to have feelings for this other person, and, and you're distancing yourself from your spouse, and then people just get divorced, or they commit adultery, and they start doing all these other things. And it's a gradual thing that happens, but you can prevent this right from the get-go, right from the beginning by just keeping yourself away from those situations and saying, I'm not going to be getting so close to anybody of the opposite gender that's not my spouse. And jealousy helps with that. If you have a, a husband or a wife that's jealous and saying, no, I don't want you doing that. Because that means they love you. That means they care about you. That means I don't want you going off with anyone else. I want you to spend time with me. I want you to be focused about me. And I don't want this to happen to our relationship. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57. We're going to see another name of God. We've seen I am. We've seen Jehovah. We've seen Jealous. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 57. I'll read from you so we don't have to, to flip there because there's a few places we're going to. Jeremiah 10, 16 says, The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So again, you know, and just to clarify too, the, the word the Lord, when you see in the King James Bible the word Lord, and it's like all capital letters, but it's kind of small, right? It's in all caps. That literally is, it's it, in the, if you were to go back to the Hebrew, that is the word, the name Jehovah. So every time you see that word Lord in all caps, that is Jehovah there. But it's 
Lord is a translation of Jehovah. That's all that is. And in the the Greek, it's kurios or something. I don't I don't remember all the I don't know Greek, but I know that that word. That's the translated word for Lord in the New Testament. And when you see the New Testament quoting Old Testament scriptures, they're using that word Lord. They're not using the word Jehovah, they're using the word Lord as the translation into Greek. So they translated the Hebrew, you know, even the, ori the original Greeks translated the Hebrew word for Jehovah of Jehovah as Lord. So when the King James does the same thing in English with the Hebrew word Jehovah as Lord, that's not a mistake. It's not an error. It's just a translation. And, um, but just so you understand that, that, when you see those all caps, that is what that means. That's what that word Lord means. It's just the translation for Jehovah, and it's a name, and it's special, so they put it in all caps. And as you'll see in um, the next place we go to, we're going to be going to Jeremiah 23, if you want to get that ready after Isaiah 57. Oftentimes you'll see some of the names of God in all caps. Not just Lord, but other names that he's given in Revelation. Um, when, it's, when Jesus Christ comes, he has a name written on his thigh. And it's called um, the word. Um, wow, I can't remember that. Anyways, I'll have to. Um, that's going to bug me if I don't get that right now. It says that he has the name on his vesture and on his thigh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's all in caps, and that's in Revelation 19. You don't have to turn there, but there is another one. Um, also, but anyways, so there's, there's a few places where it gives it all in caps, just like the Lord is all in caps, and um, but that's what that means. So Isaiah 57, look at verse number 15. Let's look at another name of God. Verse number 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So here it says God's name is holy. God's name is jealous. God's name is holy. God's name is basically eternal. I am. Holy means he's separated. He's pure. He's, he's completely separate from everybody else. He's holy. Right? I already said uh, Jeremiah 10, the Lord of hosts is his name. And that's why I was going into that, the Lord, like Jehovah. Because when it says the Lord of hosts, turn if you would to Jeremiah 23. When it says the Lord of hosts, it's different than just the Lord. It's not just Jehovah. It says the Lord of hosts is his name. So it's adding to that name of Jehovah, but he says that is his name. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. And in Amos 5.27, we see something similar. It said, the Lord of hosts is his name. In Amos 5.27, it says, Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Mm -hmm. Right? So instead of the Lord of hosts, we have his name being the Lord of hosts, the God of hosts, jealous, holy, I am that I am. Look at Jeremiah 23, verse number 5. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. And you notice that's all in caps. The Lord, our righteousness. Now, this is talking about Jesus Christ, of course. But um, we believe that, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, is a, it's a triune God. It's three parts of one God. And... Um, we're going to get into that as well um, real, real soon here. But we see here the Lord, our righteousness. And this is another more subtle proof of, of Jesus Christ because this is who it's talking about, but it's saying the Lord, our righteousness. So in, you know, and I don't know, I, didn't, I don't know if I looked this one up in the New World Translation. I doubt they say Jehovah, our righteousness, talking about, in fact, they don't. I think I did look this up. There's a few of them I, I looked up to see what they're saying. And they have a new revised version out as, as of 2013. So a lot of the references that I used to know out of, out of their false translation is, is changed. They've updated it because I think they were getting sick of people showing all the inconsistencies and problems within their own Bibles. 
So they went and they had to go and try to fix things and change them. But all that means is that they just changed something else. When you start tampering with God's word, you can never just make a change and not have it have an impact in other places. It always impacts other places of the Bible. And these people are not smart enough to be able to handle all of the different areas that it makes a change in, which is why you're able to show them contradictions within their own book that they use. And that's one of the ways I prove it's not God's word because it contradicts itself. Yep. And um, so we see that. Uh, turn, if you would, to Psalm 68. We're almost done looking at the names of God. Psalm 68. Oh, and this, this was kind of interesting. I, I quoted you um, Amos 5.27 where it said, whose name is the God of hosts. The, the, that new, new world translation changes this. It says, um, he whose name is Jehovah, the God of armies. Mm -hmm. So it said, they're trying to make sense. His name is Jehovah and then adds the God of armies as just a description, an extra description to his name instead of his name is the God of hosts. Right, two different things. Subtle changes, but they try to just emphasize that, well, his name is Jehovah, mm -hmm. and he is a, essentially, God of armies. Instead of, no, this is his name. This is a name. This is a name. These are all names of God. Psalm 68, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. So it's another name, J-A-H. And again, all in caps, Yah. That's his name. And it's, it, you know, some people say it's an abbreviation of Jehovah, but still it's saying, okay, well, that's his name. Um, Psalm 83, flip over to jo Psalm 83. This is the place that they'll like to take you to when, you, when they first say, well, do you even know what the name of God is? They always have you, look at Psalm 83. Look at Psalm number 83. Look at Psalm 83. Because this, this, this is their big proof. This is their big thing. Psalm 83, verse number 18, says that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. So see, God's only name is Jehovah. Wait, wait. Is that what that says? Psalm 83, 18 says, whose name alone is Jehovah. It doesn't say his only name is Jehovah. It says whose name alone is Jehovah. And if you want to see something really interesting, and this is, I always love it, when, when they really just are dead bent about showing me Psalm. Well, I'm listening to you. You just turn to Psalm 83. Fine. I'll turn to Psalm 83. Then what I'll do is I'll have them turn to Psalm 148. You keep your finger there and look, look at, look at the, the, the similarities between the two verses. Psalm 83, 18 whose name alone is Jehovah. And I contend all that means is that God is the only one with that name of Jehovah. I don't know about you, but I haven't run into anybody out walking, you know, walking around whose name is Jehovah. Right, no, exactly. That name belongs to God, and that belongs to God alone. He's the only one named Jehovah. Okay, that's his name. But it doesn't mean that that's his only name. We've already seen from Scripture plenty of places where he's got another name. His name is Jealous. His name is, um, and we're going to see here in verse Psalm 148, verse 13, his name is Excellent. Look at Psalm 148, verse 13. He says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Now notice Psalm 83, 18, whose name alone is Jehovah. Psalm 148, 13, his name alone is excellent. Same exact usage of grammar and of words. So by their you know, way of thinking, then I can look at Psalm 148.13 and say, well, no, God's only name is excellent. That's his only name. Don't call him Jehovah. His only name is excellent. Yeah. That's it. It's just excellent because his name alone is excellent. It's ridiculous. And that obviously proves their argument false just within the context of Scripture. Yeah. And, and that is, if they're really, I mean, if, they're, if someone's just, and th that doesn't happen that often when someone's just really just dead bad out. Like, this says the exact same thing. Okay. Yep. So let's get off of this, you know, name of Jehovah being the only name and everything else. Because it says here his name is excellent. You choose to call him Jehovah, I'm going to call him excellent. But excellent, 
another good example of, you know, maybe we should be careful with some of the words that we use these days, right? And it may not be intentional, I understand, you know, we, words kind of change over time, but people have a tendency to use words in a way that they, they don't really mean. Now, if God is going to ascribe excellent to his name, excellent seems like a word that should be properly used yeah. if it's in association with God's name, right? Now, I'm not going to just stand up here and say, you're just completely in sin if you ever use the word excellent outside of a, you know, an application of God's name. But we shouldn't just throw that word around so much to where it kind of loses its meaning of, you know, excel, ex excellent is something that excels. It's, 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 it's higher and greater than, than the rest. It's, it's a cut above, right? And that's God's name is above everything and above all other names. So when we use that word excellent, excellent describes that. Um, we shouldn't be like Bill and Ted these days and be like, oh, excellent, and like everything's just excellent and everything, you know, because that, that lowers the meaning of that word, yes. right? The more it's just thrown around and used in all kinds of different situations, the less effective it is, the, le the less meaningful it is. It doesn't mean the same thing anymore. If I were to stand up and say, oh, man, you know, this cough drop, man, this is excellent, this is an excellent cough drop. And just, this is an excellent voice recorder. This is an ex, you know, like, <laughs> you start applying it to just everything, it kind of loses its significance, right? So, you know, just keep that in mind because God's name says his name alone is excellent. And, um, and it ought to be reverenced. Now, let's flip over to the New Testament. Let's go to Acts chapter 4 because God's names all have meaning. They're all important. Right? But if we're going to focus on a name at all, I think we should focus on the name that's above all other names. Yeah, that's right. According to God's word. Look at X, or Acts chapter 4, verse number 10. Acts 4.10 says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must right. be saved. Amen. There is no other name under heaven that's going to give us salvation other than the name of Jesus Christ. Right. So I don't want to sit here and focus on the name of Jehovah when Jesus Christ is the name whereby we must be saved. Right. This is what we need to hear. Salvation, John 3.18 says, um, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. You have to believe on that name. You have to believe on the name of Jesus Christ for your salvation. Uh, John 20, 31 says, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. Yep. The name of Jesus Christ. When I go out talking to these JWs, I don't want to focus on the name of Jehovah. I want to focus on the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the name that's going to bring them salvation. Ephesians chapter 1. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and then we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 20. The Bible says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Verse uh, 21 says, far, far above, and he mentions all these things, and then continues on, every name that is named. 
The name of Jesus Christ is far above every name that is named. He says, not only in this world, not just here, but in the world which is to come. The name of Jesus Christ is far above every name. Look at Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 5 reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it's funny, in the New Testament too, the New World Translation they change that word Lord to Jehovah. And it, you know where they don't change it to, to Jehovah? Is in Philippians 2.11. Wouldn't that be something if they were to say that Jesus Christ is Jehovah? Yep. Nope. Yeah, they won't do that. They should. they should, but they don't do it. But Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ does have a name which is above every name. And Jesus Christ, hey, every knee is going to bow. And this is, see... I tried explaining this to, the, to that guy as well. In the Ten Commandments, right? God said not to have any other gods before him. That you shall not bow down. You shouldn't worship them. You shouldn't have any other gods. Yep. Then why would it bring glory and honor unto God the Father if every knee is going to bow down and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? If God's a jealous God... And if Jesus Christ isn't God in the flesh, if he's just some other being, or if he's as their Bible says, he is a God. In John 1, 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what the real Bible says. Their version says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. A God. So Jesus Christ is a God. And this is what I always like to ask him. How many gods do you believe in? Well, there's only one God. Let's look at John 1.1 1, 1 in, your, in your Bible there. What does it say? It says, hey God, how many gods do you believe in? Just one. Is Jesus God? Yep. Is he a God? How many? And, and it, I've asked this to so many people, and nobody will say they believe in more than one God. It's right in front of you. They just kind of sit there with a dumbfounded look like, well, uh, how many gods? Is God a jealous God? Does God want you worshiping and bowing down and confessing unto a false God, unto another God other than himself? No. How could it bring honor and glory unto God the Father then for you to bow down to a man, to a created being, to what your Bible calls a God without, without contradicting your scripture, without, without contradicting what God already said in the Ten Commandments? and everything that is about God. All throughout history, when he brought the children of Israel into bondage, when he let the, the four nations come in and decimate them, it's always because they turned away from the Lord and they served false gods without fail. Every time, that's what they did. God doesn't want them. He gets angry. He gets wrathful when they go and turn and serve other gods. Every single time. Yet you're going to call Jesus a God. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. This is one that I try to get to without fail when, when I have a good conversation where people are actually listening to me that, that is a Jehovah's false witness. Because what, you, what, I, what I've tried to do is use passages where their Bible doesn't change it. You see, there's a lot of great scripture to use to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to prove that he's God in the flesh, to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. But the problem is that some of these references, if you have someone they really want to check their, check their Bible, they'll be different. For example, I mean, great... Now look, if 
you know, use what you know and use what's come, or use what you can use because it's still God's word that hopefully can pierce their heart. So like 1 Timothy 3.16, right? One of my favorite verses. Um, the greatest the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I mean, it doesn't get much more clear than that. God was made a man. God was manifest in the flesh, right? But their, ver their version changes that to he was manifest in the flesh. Not God was manifest in the flesh, just he. So that, that he could be anybody. That he is Jesus. But that's not giving him the, the, the deity, right? So that's one example. There's a couple other examples too um, where they'll change it. Um, I looked this up too because I act 759 uh, where Stephen was getting stoned. Um, for he preached, you know, all that 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 long message, and then they they got angry and they ran and they stopped their ears and and they stoned him with stones. And in Acts seven fifty nine, it says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. There we have again, Stephen is. It says the narrator of the Bible says he's calling on God, and what he says is Lord Jesus. Yeah. Proving, again, Jesus Christ is God. But their translation will conveniently drops calling upon God. Their translation just, just well, we'll just get rid of that section of scripture right there. We'll pretend like that never existed. Yep. So when you go to places, it's, it's, it's helpful, I think, to be able to prove if they really just want to check their scriptures from their New World translation because you can still prove everything in places where they haven't made the changes in their version. Um, and one of those places, Isaiah 9, 6. Because I st I'll start, and I always like to start off asking them, what is this talking about before we get into the meat? It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is that talking about? This is, I mean, everybody knows that, anyone who knows anything about Christianity has been in church for a little while, you hear this at Christmas time all the time, over and over again. This phrase just gets repeated. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Everybody knows is talking about Jesus Christ. I've never had an argument about this ever in all my years soul winning, someone saying, no, that's not Jesus. Everybody will agree this is talking about Jesus Christ. So I, I establish that and say, okay, well, let's keep reading. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of, Pre Prince of Peace. Okay, it says that his name, he is the Everlasting Father. Jesus Christ is the Everlasting Father. Why would you even call him the Everlasting Father? As you say, God the Father, Jehovah. Why would you call him that if it's not true? His name is the Everlasting Father. And that is in their translation as well. And you could show them that. Now... Will they get saved? I don't know. But at least you could give them something to think about, something to chew over, and, and, and you know, hopefully something will pierce through to, um, to wake them up to the deception. Because that's the goal, right? The goal isn't to just prove somebody wrong. You talk to, to people you know that, that buy into this Jehovah's Witness. The whole reason we talk to them to begin with is because we love them and we want them to get saved. We want to show them the truth of salvation. And oftentimes people have been brainwashed and just been, been in these cults for a long period of time and they've just had this just hammered into them. So it might take a little bit of time. But and especially people that you're in, you're in more close contact with or people who are at least open to having a discussion that you can talk with a little bit more frequently. Hey, these are a lot of things that you could bring up. You could show them all these different names. Show them Isaiah 9, 6 specifically. That's a, that's a very good one. And um, I'll close with this last. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 43 and 45 because this is one other place that I like to, to take them. Now, this, this isn't necessarily have to do with the name of, of God. We've kind of covered that. That's a, Isaiah 9, 6. We see all these other names of Jesus, right? We saw his name. His name is wonderful. His name is counselor. His name is the mighty God. His name is the everlasting father. His name is the prince of peace. Those are all names given to Jesus Christ. It's not just one name. He has all of these names and they all have meaning and they're all important. Of course, the name of Jesus Christ, though, is the name that's above all other names. And that is the name that we preach and that's the name that we need to be saved by. But um, Isaiah 43, 
I, I always go to Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45 to just bolster because this is another place where it'll say something very similar, the same thing in their translation. And this is why I use these chapters because I'll ask them, okay, who is the Savior? Without fail, they'll say Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Savior. Who's the Savior? Okay. As long as we have this established, Jesus is the Savior, right? Look at Isaiah 43. Look at verse number 10. He says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And this is always a good one after you show him John 1 and ask him how many gods are there, right? Jesus was a God. He says, hey, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. How could Jesus be a God if there were no gods formed before or after him? How is that possible? But then theirs will say the same thing. Look at verse number 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Right. Is Jesus the Savior? Right. Jehovah says he's the Savior. Now that's not a problem for me. That's right. We believe in a triune God. We believe the three are one. We believe there's one Lord. That's a problem for the Jehovah's Witness that separates the Son of God from God right. completely as, as two completely different entities altogether that Jesus is not God in the flesh. Who's the Savior? Verse 12, I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Now you notice, verse number 10, he says, and understand that I am he. Verse number 13, he says, I am he. And this is where if, if someone's really listening to you and, and giving you time and is, and is kind of, you know, accept, or at least hearing you out and, and not re rejecting and not resisting what you're saying, you could show them John chapter 8. I said I also turn to Isaiah 45, and, and you can do that too if you want to mark it up in your Bible or something or take a note, um, because there's more references where God is just saying the same exact thing we saw in Isaiah 43. He says, there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. He says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. As th th those are, and there's a lot of verses like that in Isaiah 45 and in Isaiah 43. So if you, if you just kind of go through both of them, that was Isaiah 45 verses 21 and 22. But um, it's, ba it's basically saying the same thing. Okay, it, it's just more uh, just saying, look, he says it over and over and over again. It's just me. There is none else. There is no other God formed. It's me, right? But in Isaiah 43, we also saw that where he said, um, you know, I am he. I am he. Why is this important? Well, we saw that his name was I am. Right? God's name. When, when he's talking to Moses, I am that I am. Tell him I am has sent you. In Isaiah 43, he's saying, I am he. Because I am he. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse number 24. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's Jesus Christ speaking. Jesus Christ claiming to be, I am he. Verse number 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. That was verse 28, and then verse number uh, 56, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and when he saw it and he saw it and was glad, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Amen. Jesus Christ is the I am just as much as Jehovah is the I am. Yep. Jesus Christ, you know, Jehovah appeared unto Moses, I am that I am. Jesus Christ says, before Abraham was, I am, because Jesus is everlasting just as much as God is everlasting. God the Father. 
Jehovah. Hopefully you could, you could come across someone who's willing to listen and receive and not just reject. And it doesn't happen that often because a lot of them are just, just heretically just rejecting, rejecting. And the Bible says that, you know, a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Because you don't need to be, like I said, you don't need, you could, you could win the argument. You've got the Bible to support what you're saying and what you believe. It's, it's evident, right? There's so many places we could go and prove it. But if they're not receiving it at all, it's fruitless, it's vain. There is no point in just continuing to try to win the argument. That's not what we talk to people about the gospel for. It's to win their soul. So in, for the sake of not wasting our own time and not wasting God's time and being able to get to someone who will listen, the Bible says a heretic after the first and second, you give them a couple chances. Give them a be like, look, I want to show you something out of the Bible. I want to, you know, I know you don't believe the same way as me, but I want to show you this. Oh no, yeah, I don't that, that doesn't matter. I don't believe that. You know, my Bible says this. Okay, let me show you somewhere else. Okay, look at look at what the Bible says here. No, no, yeah, no, no. Bye bye. Have a good day. Amen. Have a good day. And you know what? Maybe another day. Maybe their heart will be in a different position. Maybe something will change. Maybe they'll be humbled. Maybe they'll have seen some hypocrisy. Or maybe they'll see something else that will start to change their mind. And another day, maybe they'll be more receptive to hearing the word. But that day, when people are like that, just go. Yep. See him. Because I'm going to go to the next house. I'm going to talk to the next person. Someone else will be, will be receptive. Someone else will be ready to listen. So we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to win the argument. But it's important to have the information at hand and to know it well and be able to turn there to show people because some people are receptive. Some people will be, especially those that just get started into this stuff. I got a guy saved when, um, I didn't, Sebastian got a guy saved that was starting to have the Jehovah's Witnesses come to his house and do their Bible study and everything else. And he was starting to, to, to get sucked into that a little bit. But praise the Lord, he led us to that door and Sebastian gave him the gospel and he got saved and he came to church, he got baptized. Now, you know, he hasn't been here for in a while, but he's saved. Yeah, that's right. And he's rejected that false teaching. And, um, you know, there, there are people like that and sometimes you're going to need to go through some of this stuff because they've been being taught a different way. But it's important that, that we learn these things and understand these things. But let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And God, um, we know that you have many names and they all are of importance, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, help us to remember and keep your names in reverence. And um, we thank you so much for the name that is above all names, dear Lord, the name of Jesus Christ that you've given us for salvation. God, help us to be bold in preaching that name and, um, and standing by that, on that name, dear Lord, and um, not wavering but preaching the, the word boldly that we may bring that salvation to, to those that are lost. I pray that you would please just be with us this afternoon as we go out and knock on doors, dear God. And I pray that you would please just help us to have great results, great success, and lead us to the people that, whose hearts you've already worked on, dear God, that, um, that we, can, we can just truly be your messengers and your ambassadors, dear Lord, to, um, to bring salvation to these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.